just a closer walk with thee. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk, dear Lord, close to thee. Just a closer walk with me. Grant it, Jesus, if you please. Daily walking close to me. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is o'er. Time for me will be no more. On that bright eternal shore, I will walk, dear Lord, close to Thee. Just a closer walk with Thee. Jesus, if you please, daily walking close to thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Amen. Good morning. Should we look to the Lord in prayer? Our God and our Father, once again, it's our privilege to come to thee in the worthy name of of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. We thank you for the Spirit of God that makes the Word of God alive to our hearts. We pray it might happen today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, David the Shepherd King, we've entitled this, The Unproachable Fool. Uh, as the theater curtain dropped on the cave scene of En Gedi, Saul had just finished his confessional performance. Though in Getty's rocky ground is wet with Saul's tears, his rocky heart remains dry like an arid desert land. In other words, we judge Saul's sorrow to be the sorrow of the world and not the sorrow of God. It will be a short wait before Saul will be back pursuing David and seeking his death. 2 Corinthians 7.10 For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. The sorrow of God has in view the dishonor done to God because of our sin. The sorrow of the world has in view the personal cost to us because of our sin. The sorrow of the world leaves the person unchanged, in this case, Saul, the sorrow of God is transformative because it invites God to change the heart. Amen. 1 Samuel 24, 22. And Saul went home, but David and his men gate them up into the hold. So as Saul returns home, David and his men wisely remain in hiding. But though David may hide from Saul, he cannot hide from sorrow, and neither can you or I. 25.1 And Samuel died. And all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented and buried him in the house at Ramah. Samuel was David's friend and counselor. In the last couple of years, many of us have lost relatives and friends to the virus and other causes. Nevertheless, as difficult as it is to face the death of someone close to you, it should be expected. It is inevitable. No one is immune to death. The shadow of death is upon us all. The fear of death is common to all men and women. But it is a secret that only when we are prepared to die can we truly live. 
It's a secret because the devil wants to keep it a secret. He wants humanity to live in bondage to fear. But Christ came that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. The Bible is clear that men and women who fear death are in bondage. Death is so fearful because it rips from our grasp everything that is dear to us. Everything. But amazingly, this enemy of mankind is also the enemy of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 16. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. This is a most important consideration because death is the enemy of men. Death is also the enemy of God because God is for mankind and not against us. And to prove it, Hebrews tells us that Christ came into the world to take from the devil the power of death that men and women might be free from the bondage of death. Let me repeat, because death is the enemy of men, death is also the enemy of God, because God is for mankind and not against us. And to prove it, Hebrews tells us that Christ came into the world to take from the devil the power of death, that men and women might be free from bondage to death. Hallelujah. And how did Christ gain this victory over death? over this enemy of man and God through death, Hebrews 2.14. It was through his death that Christ won the victory over death. This truth is pictured in David using Goliath's own sword to cut off Goliath's own head, 1 Samuel 17.51. Death was the devil's weapon. He used that weapon upon Christ. Christ took the full pains of death, but the devil's weapon had no power over him, Acts 2.24. Christ was holy and without sin, and death is only a lethal weapon upon sinners. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. But the sinless one did, in fact, die. Even so, it was for our sins that he died, and the wages of sin he paid in full in his most terrible sufferings and death. And sin's debt was not paid by his sufferings at the hands of men, but sin's debt was paid by Christ's unfathomable sufferings for sin at the hand of a holy God. And the declaration of his great victory was in resurrection. The third day he arose. Hallelujah. Death couldn't hold him. The grave couldn't keep him. Acts 2.24 and 1 Corinthians 15.55. And in his death and resurrection, both sin and death's unbreakable grip upon sinners is forever loosed the moment the sinner believes. Glory. And moreover, Having been set free from the fear of death, the believer in the Lord Jesus is free to live, truly live. The believer no longer has to lay hold of and to clutch this present world. This world is no longer his home. His life has already begun in another world. He has eternal life with Christ in heaven. Glory, glory. 1 John 5, 11 and Ephesians 2, 6. So David has lost Samuel, his friend and counselor. He had already lost his wife, Michael, his job as commander, his freedom. He is a fugitive, and he's lost the companionship of his best friend, Jonathan. He has left his father and family in Moab and has had residence in two caves. Sometimes when God is working in your life, it might be a little painful. 
but it's been observed, it's always darkest before the dawn. However, David has a bit more darkness in store before the sunrise. 25.1 And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. And there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. David and his men decided that though cave life was a safe life, it was too confining. So they set up camp in the grassy wilderness of Paran, around 15 miles to the southwest of Engedi. And there they met the shepherd servants of wealthy Nabal. Nabal was a man with some definite character issues. The first hint as to possible character flaws is that his name means foolish. Then he is described as churlish and evil. So Nabal is a foolish, bad-tempered, and evil, though very rich man. But someone has said that the real measure of wealth is how much you'd be worth if you lost all your money. Well, by that standard, Nabal wouldn't be worth much. Maybe like a, a zero with the rim kicked off. However, we must remember that though Nabal may not have been the garden variety sinner, even with all his corruptness, he was, after all, just another sinner. Sinners come in all shapes and sizes. And each of us is our own unique shape and size of sinner too. So, of all the woolies in the valley of Paran, David and his men settled near Nabal's shepherds. But God was in these details. Nabal's wife is described as a wise and beautiful woman. We can only assume that Abigail and Nabal's marriage was arranged by the family. No doubt Nabal's family saw early on that an arranged marriage was their best chance of finding a wife for their son. He certainly wasn't going to win a wife with charm. Like Abigail, many of the women in the Bible are described as beautiful. Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Esther, Abishag, to name a few. There is certainly no shame in beauty when it is coupled with godliness. Peter contrasts the inner beauty of a woman with her outer beauty, 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden person of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. Proverbs 11.22 As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. So God sets beauty as desirable, as a jewel of gold. But to use beauty as sex appeal for profit should be left to the hog harlots of Hollywood, those with swine snouts, to say it plainly. Verse 4, And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Get you up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus shall ye say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace be to thine house, and peace be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shears. Now thy shepherds which were with us, we hurt them not. Neither was there aught missing unto them. All the while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they shall show thee. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes. For we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son, David. Now, David had made no agreement with Nabal to protect his 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. But he graciously did protect them. David was a shepherd himself. Naturally, 
He had an affinity for shepherds and the work they did. No doubt David's men and Nabal's shepherds came to know each other and spent time together around the campfires at night. So it's shearing time, and David sent men to ask Nabal to share with David in the blessing. David is simply asking that Nabal recognize he and his men's efforts in protecting Nabal's sheep. Nabal could rejoice in the season's success, at least in part, because of David's graciousness. And David and his men had put their lives in jeopardy protecting Nabal's flocks. Remember, the Philistines were continually marauding Israel's harvest, even as they robbed the threshing floors of Caleb, 1 Samuel 23, 1. Every believer should recognize that just as David's graciousness had a claim upon Nabal, so God's grace has a claim upon our lives. Titus 2, 11 and 12. Here is God's grace. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And now here is God's claim, verse 12. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 2 Corinthians 5, 15. Here is God's grace, verse 15. And that he died for all. And now here is God's claim that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Amen. God's grace is indeed absolutely free, but it cost Christ everything. And Christ did far, far more than to only put his life in jeopardy, as David's men did. No, to protect you and I, from the merciless marauders of sin and death, he laid down his life for us. At the cross, he became a wall between us and the fiery judgment of God. He is indeed the good shepherd who giveth his life for the sheep. John 10, 11 and 15. And an acronym for the word grace, G-R-A-C-E, is God's riches at Christ's expense. And if the proper response to receiving a gift is thankfulness. What overwhelming thankfulness should pour from the hearts of those of us who have received the exceeding riches of God's grace in Christ. And this thankfulness should find expression in lives dedicated to our Redeemer, the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 9, 15. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. But Nabal knows nothing of grace, nor appreciation, nor even hospitality. Verse 10. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread? and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be? Nabal's claim not to know David is like someone over 40 not knowing Rocky Balboa. Hard to imagine. But of course, Nabal did know David. He is a large rancher. He certainly trades his wool in Jerusalem some 25 miles away. And we shall see that Abigail knows David's reputation very well. Nabal is simply disrespecting David. He undoubtedly is not willing to share any of his blessings with David and his 600 men. Overall, the human race is not a thankful people. Romans 1.21 Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. Luke 17.17 17. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed lepers, he's speaking of, but where are the nine? But the believer is certainly called to be thankful. Colossians 3.15 And be ye thankful. 1 Thessalonians 3.18 And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Remember the lyrics to the song, Count Your Blessings? When upon life's billows 
you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your blessings, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one, count your blessings, see what God has done. Many times we believers are more proficient at counting troubles than counting blessings. We all need to work on changing that. Now, David is a type of our Lord Jesus Christ as the anointed, the rejected king. But like all men and women of faith, David falls short of behaving consistent with the moral beauties of the Lord Jesus. Verse 12. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him all those sayings. And David said unto his men, Gird ye every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword, and David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 men abode by the stuff. I don't suppose any of us, when pushed, whether physically or verbally, have not experienced the carnal nature's reflexive response to push back. But such a response is ungodly. The spring of this retaliatory impulse of the heart is pride. Who are you to push me? Capital M-E. Only God knows how many problems each of us have experienced or maybe even now are experiencing because of this very failure. What a victory of the Holy Spirit when we learn, or at least begin to learn, how to deal with personal offense in a forbearing and long-suffering manner. In other words, how to guard our hearts and to keep our mouths shut. The Lord Jesus himself often had cause to be offended when he was in this world. Luke 9, 52 and 53 and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. James and John wanted to rain down fire from heaven and destroy the village. But the Lord Jesus quietly went on to another village. Verse 56. And the offense against him increased. John 8, 48 and 49. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. It is difficult to imagine that the Jews would heap such contemptuous words upon the Lord Jesus, and this to his face. But it is even more difficult to imagine that he would allow it. However, soon they shall see his face again, but then it shall be blazing with a brightness greater than 10,000 suns. And from the fierceness of his gaze, the earth and the heaven shall flee, and yet no hiding place shall be found for them. Revelation 20 and 11. But at that moment when facing the Jews, he was the gentle and lowly one. His response was with calm reason and in truth. And then the most grievous of offenses was the night before his trial and crucifixion at the house of Caiaphas, the high priest. Matthew 26, 67. They did, then did they spit in his face. And they buffeted him, and others smote him with the palms of their hands. Well might every believer agree with Mr. Spurgeon's holy sentiment. When I read that they spit in his face, I want to kiss his feet. Amen and amen. But the Son of God had taken the form of a servant. He humbled himself and in lowly obedience received the cup of sorrows, a cup that included sufferings at the hand of man 1 Peter 2, 22, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. Acts 8, 32, 
and he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before her, his shears, opened not his mouth. And a cup that included sufferings at the hand of God. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? As the hymn writer penned, Jehovah lifted up his rod. O Christ, it fell on thee. Thou wast sore stricken of thy God. There's not one stroke for me. Thy tears, thy blood beneath it flowed. Thy bruising healeth me. So while David and his men are putting on their combat fatigues, back at Nabal's house, a wise and fearful servant is speaking to his master's wife. Wise in that he avoided Nabal and fearful because he understood there was danger in the wind. Verse 14, but one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. But the men were very good unto us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall unto us both by night and day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. The unnamed servant shepherd confirms the protection that David and his men had provided them in the fields. And the servant evidently has real confidence in Abigail to speak about her husband so forthrightly. For Nabal to be called a son of Belial is not a compliment. It was used to describe Eli's wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, 1 Samuel 2.12. Other translations have son of worthlessness. But not only is Nabal characterized as worthless, but also unapproachable. How sad to be unapproachable by others. Nabal was the kind of person that you spoke with only if it was absolutely necessary. He was always in a bad mood. His temper might flare up at any moment and seemingly without provocation. He was rude, vile in language, and argumentative. Nabal was everything that a believer in the Lord Jesus should not be. How can we act as messengers of the gospel of God's love in Christ if we are not humble, kind, compassionate, loving, and thereby approachable. The Lord Jesus was the most approachable man that ever lived. His character was beautifully attractive. The thirsty woman at Jacob's well was drawn by his love and acceptance and thirsted no more. She had had six men and was still incomplete, but she found completeness in the seventh man, God's man, the Lord Jesus Christ. The woman that came to Simon the Pharisee's house had been overcome by sin, but now was overcome by grace. She anointed the Lord Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair and anointed his feet with precious ointment. The woman caught in adultery stood before her accusers robed in her guilt and shame, but then not one accuser remained and she was left alone with the Lord. She stood with him, amazed that by him, Judgment had passed over her, and that by him she had been clothed in dignity and a new purity. Hallelujah. Mary Magdalene had been bound by demons, and now she was bound by love for the Lord Jesus. When he was risen, he appeared to her at the garden tomb. She took hold of him, determined that never again would she let him go. The little children stayed near him. They were attracted by his lovely smile and gentle laughter and by the kindness of his eyes. How often he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Only heaven knows all the hopeless ones that approached the blessed Son of God and found love and acceptance and living hope in him. John 21, 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they be written every one, 
I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. How absolutely inadequate all the words of the human language to tell the whole story of Jesus and his wonderful love. Glory. Amen. A blessed God and our Father, we thank thee for our Savior, the Lord Jesus. He is indeed altogether lovely. We want to know him more and we want to be able to tell others about this wonderful one that has saved us, that lives for us, preparing a place for us in the glory. We pray that we would be approachable people that would be kind and gentle, that would express the love of God in a way that glorifies thee. Help us, we pray. We commit ourselves to thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.